Stillwater Critical Minerals, what's going on? Well, thanks. Glad to be here. Uh, we're excited by what we have in Montana. We're in an iconic U.S. district that's been producing critical minerals really since the late 1880s, um, sometimes with government support historically. Uh, we're right beside Sabanye Stillwater and the iconic Stillwater Mines. We've been there for several years now. We've got 40,000 meters of drilling done. We've brought ex-Ivanhoe geologists in at a senior level. Um, that's the first piece of the Platte Reef model that we're bringing to these rocks. Uh, most recently, we brought Glencore in as, uh, first of all, a 9.9% shareholder, then a 15.4% equity holding, mm -hmm. and most recently on the board. Their vice president, Bradley Adamson, is, is on our board. So we're excited by where this is going. I've been down to site a number of times this year to tour federal politicians around, so you can mm -hmm. bet we're talking to the right people. Uh, and we have some lesser grants in place too. The vision here is critical mineral supply in the U.S., and that's what we're hearing from both Glencore, Department of Defense, and U.S. government. Really want to work that out, too. Um, I had as a few different companies that I've interviewed. Critical minerals, is they're becoming more critical, <laughs> if you would. And I think it's such a neglected place, but not, not I do not think in the distant future, if you would. Um, Tell me a bit really about, about the macro here, and then let's go micro. Why critical minerals and right, why right now? America offshored too much over the past decades. Yeah. Manufacturing and mining. Mm -hmm. And now is bringing it back big time. And the subsidies the US government has put in place, the initiatives have led the world. Canada has basically struggled to keep up, the EU, you know, other countries. It really begins in 2016 with Senator Murkowski of Alaska and Manchin. And My home critical, state. Yeah, there you go. Mm -hmm. And the critical minerals lists and the recognition, you know, early rare earths were a big one. Mm -hmm. But it, it, the list is now about 50 commodities long. Yeah. Um, we have nine of them. Okay, so tell yeah. me about the nine that you have and why are they critical? Sure. Well, uh, when we sat down with the DOD, that was basically our question. Which of the nine do you want us to focus on? <laughs> or do you want us to focus on? Right. You know, we have 2.3 billion pounds of chromium, mm -hmm. but that's not really their focus. Uh, we have 1 billion pounds of nickel. That's the big one. 1 billion pounds of nickel? The U.S. has yeah. no nickel supply chain. One small nickel mine, very little nickel processing, no nickel smelter. Why, you know, and I'm meeting with the Army Research Lab and explaining this to them, and they're getting it. Um, mm -hmm. And back to the start of our conversation, they're funding it. They're funding you? They're funding us to explore and develop and de-risk these assets. They recognize that they need that supply chain. So that is a huge story, of course, but why didn't they, my next question is, why did, why did they do this now and not five years ago, 10 years ago? That's a really good question. <laughs> Where do most of the metals in our cell phones come from? China? China owns the bulk of it. Majority of nickel. In fact, China is flooding the market with Indonesian nickel supply. Yes. That's widely talked about. That's why BHP closed Nickel West, one of the biggest sulfide nickel sources in the world. Right. Chinese Indonesian stuff is laterite. Whole separate conversation. They've also tied up a lot of the uh, cobalt of the Congo. Yeah. Graphite, they lead the world in processing by far. They don't actually mine a lot of graphite, but they process it. The U.S. woke up to that. The Western world woke up to that. As we get away from globalization and, and supply chains are disrupted everywhere, the recognition of that exposure is, is very real. Yeah. Um, and the U.S., particularly through an antiquated piece of legislation, the Defense Production Act, Title III of 1950, various administrations have called this in to fund um, what they need strategically. And in the past few years, we've seen some very large matching grant funds for critical minerals. Lithium, uh, graphite, nickel. So lithium, graphite, and nickel, that is what you're aimed to produce. We don't have lithium, unfortunately. We don't have lithium. Okay, so graphite and nickel. We don't have graphite either. What so we have, nickel. to answer your original question, yes. is a billion pounds of nickel. A billion pounds uh, of nickel. We're the largest uh, nickel resource in an active U.S. mining district. Right. We have 91 million pounds of cobalt that's not That's what I want to know, cobalt. Yeah. 
And that's caught a lot of attention. We have half a billion pounds of copper, but that's it's not one. critical on all lists in the US. It's on the DOE list, but not on some of the others. We also have all six platinum group elements, five of which are critical, uh, and chromium as well. And okay. that's the nine. Got it. So you also have copper. Tell me how much copper you have again. Just under half a billion pounds. Under half a billion pounds. So it's hard for me to get my mind around these. These numbers are ginormous here. Let's well, a billion pounds is a threshold for a major. Yes, so that's what a, I'm talking about. We're already halfway to a pure copper deposit. You're already there with copper. And Sabanye is, is mining two kilometers next door to us. The infrastructure is there. Our ground is brownfields. It has a history of production. Yes. Sabanye is actively producing from really three mines, two mills right next door to us. It's a very good setup. So you're already, and please interrupt me if I'm wrong, you're already looking at major production, or I should say major find in nickel, yeah. cobalt, and copper. And PGEs as well. Yeah, to roll the numbers properly, 1.6 billion pounds of nickel, copper, cobalt, 3.8 million ounces of PGEs, gold, platinum group elements and gold. So it's already world-class stuff. The district, if you look at our figures, this is really five deposits across nine and a half kilometers that yeah. really want to connect. And I know there are many juniors here telling you that their deposits are connected. Ours are connected by soils on surface, drill results where available, geophysics, Mm -hmm. suggest that they really want to connect. Most, and, and historically, our neighbor's deposit, what Sabanya is mining, runs across 28 miles. So it's contiguous across that whole 10 kilometer core that we have, and that's the best thing that we can point to yeah. to say that we're likely continuous and very likely to grow. So let's talk about that. I got an idea of the numbers of what you're looking of what you're doing and what you're looking at as far as taking out of the ground. Sure. Tell me specifically then about the project, where it's around, the jurisdiction as you mentioned. Right. Okay. Tell me about that. We're in south central Montana. Okay. Uh, the Stillwater Igneous Complex is something that geologists study in in textbooks in geology school. It's, yeah. a, it's a thing of beauty. It, it is. looks like the Bushveld complex, South Africa. Yeah. And that's why it's so meaningful that Danny Grobler left Robert Friedman. He was chief geologist and joined us as vice president of exploration. Last week we debuted the model that he and Albie Brits have worked up and it's a thing of beauty across that whole yeah. lower comp. This is a big layered magmatic system and we're the first ones modeling it. That's the first piece. Uh, South Central Montana. Let me interrupt you. That is probably the number one jurisdiction in the world, correct me if I'm not wrong. For? For mining. It's a very strong mining district. Yes. 24 billion pounds of copper have come out of Montana. Yes. Butte area particularly. It's fantastic. Um, it's America's only palladium platinum mines mm -hmm. currently. Yeah. And in fact, the best in the Western world by yeah. far. Highest grade in the world and very large. Um, What's not talked about as much is that Sabanye's mines next door to us are actually nickel copper sulfide mines. It's a nickel copper sulfide reef. Mm -hmm. It's just they don't bother to report their nickel copper numbers because it's so dominant in palladium platinum. They're half an ounce per ton grade. It's, it's beautiful stuff. Okay. Lots of metal in the district, lots of metal in the complex. That was, right. And all this was put down 2.7 billion years ago at the same time. Yeah. Um, it, it, it's, it's a really neat system. Unlike the Bushveld, it was tipped up by Wyoming to the south of us. So yep. everything is on sort of a 60 degree angle. Yep. Their mines, our stuff comes right to surface, but we're in those bigger magmatic events just adjacent to them. Very much like Ivan, Ivanhoe uh, Platte Reef Mine mm -hmm. and Mahalakwena Anglo-Americans Cash Cow. Two giant nickel mines in South Africa. They're known as PGM mines, but they actually uh, are nickel mines. So, <clears throat> where are you exactly at as far as permitting is concerned, and as far as, um, yeah, and what's the ETA in production? How far along are you on that? Well, the way the public markets have been performing has dragged out our time, our view to production, and that's frustrating to us. That's something that the U.S. government gets, mm -hmm. and that's why these grants are so meaningful. We've basically pitched them that you can chop the time here in half. Okay, so, so let me interrupt you. We're talking about grants and permitting. How does that work together? Right. Grants, separate. Right. Permits have always been uh, relatively easy where we are. 
Um, it's mining country, mining yes. is understood. Uh, if there's ever been a challenge, it's because bandwidth is limited because there's a miner right next door yeah. and they take a bit of bandwidth. We've always been able to get, we, we were actually permitted on a very large area of the project. So you're already currently. permitted? Oh yeah, yeah. Five year drill permit, exploration permit, not mine permit. Got it. That's and what I was asking. And we're just now expanding that to the west. Yeah. As we go to mine permits, um, I don't see a problem there, especially if we've got the federal support. Let's get to that then. So you have, more or less, if you have the federal support to get you permitted for a mine, yeah. what does an ETA look like on production? We would need to do a PEA mm -hmm. and feasibility studies. Yep. There's several years invested there. Mm -hmm. Already. Then you've got... Uh, we haven't done those yet. You haven't done those no. yet. We're okay. blessed to have historic metallurgy, though, okay. which looks very favorable. Okay. Uh, from 1972, speaking of, of past work on the project. So that's all lining up very well. Okay. Um, really, three years, four years to a full blown bankable feasibility Got study. It. That's what I want to know. That's, yeah. From there, you make production decisions, you build it. Um, I believe it could be producing in five years would be fast, seven years would be reasonable. Mm -hmm. The government is interested because it's less than 10 and it's about the only thing, one of very few projects in the pipeline that could do that. You stole my question. If you're the only guy in, in town in the U.S., you'd seem things, it would seem things would be expedited, correct me if I'm wrong. Well, if you look at the nickel picture, because we're pro-mining district, mm -hmm. correct. Mm -hmm. uh, the big nickel projects are in Minnesota. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, and one of them just had a 20-year moratorium against mining handed on about a year ago. Yep. That's the climate. The other ones have been in permitting for 17 years. <laughs> All right. right. And one of them is funded by Glencore, right. who invested in us, and you have to think that yes. Montana's looking pretty good right now. Yeah. Um, there are the only producing mine, nickel mine, in the U.S. <laughs> is in that part of the world. It's the Eagle Mine, run by Lundin Mining. Yep, it's great Michigan. name. Oh, it's a, it's a beautiful mine, but it's yeah. small. Yeah. It's about, I'm forgetting my numbers, it's about a twelfth of what the U.S. consumes every year in nickel. And there's no supply chain around that for them to sell concentrate to. Interesting. And it's gonna close in a few years just due to depletion. Yeah. Um, good mine, but what we have is big. Um, yes. We haven't talked about grade, but we have also optionality on grade. We're not married to a low grade model. Mm -hmm. That makes us more attractive because whatever your metal price landscape, mm -hmm. we're also polymetallic too, so we're less married to one commodity than another. We've got really good optionality there as we look to wrap PEA studies around this and advance the project. Okay, so let's talk about grade. What, kind of, what grade are we looking at? Quarter billion tons at 0.39% nickel equivalent. Okay. That's in our bulk tonnage scenario. That's the 1.6 billion pound, 3.8 million ounce top line. Mm -hmm. There's a mid-grade scenario. It's about 120 million tons at a 0.51% nickel equivalent. Okay. And then there's a high grade within that that's only about 12 million tons, but it's running over a percent. I think it's 1.05% nickel equivalent grade. So again, you know, whichever way you need to go, uh, it's there. It's also all open for expansion, really probably along 32 kilometers. Um, that gets very forward looking. Yeah. Um, we've only modeled that 9.5 kilometer middle bit in detail yet, but the prototype zone is 800 meters thick. And Bob Moriarty said drunk monkeys could drill this project. It's all mineralized. <laughs> I will tell Bob, I talk to him often, I'll tell Bob okay. that he said that. Please Let's do. talk about the, uh, the team you have and the team you put together as well as yourself and your own experience that would, um, that's been put together to put this project forward. And I, to be candid with you, I know only you and very little about the team, so I want to know more about the team. Sure. I've been in mining since 1990. Mm -hmm. I founded this company in 2007. I hold six million shares now, options and warrants on more. Really, the turnaround came when I met Greg Johnson, and we're basically following the playbook that he did at Nova Gold. In fact, in all three metallic group companies. With Nova Gold. Yeah. Great uh, brand. Yes. District scale acquisition in the bear market, when bigger companies are dropping these things. Grab them, build them out into a better market, mm -hmm. watch your cycle, and in their case, go from 10 cents a share to 2 billion in market cap. And that's right. exactly what we're trying to do with all three metallic group companies, including Stillwater. Uh, 
Gregor Hamilton is a wonderful guy, ex-banker, ex-geologist. Don't think you'd know him. No. We added Nora Pincus recently. She's a Montana local uh, and a top-notch mine financier, mine lawyer. Uh, okay. Formerly with Nabari, now with Empress Royalty. And then Bradley Adamson, um, the, uh, the VP business development of a little company called Glencore. Oh, Never and, heard of them. And a, met <laughs> and a metallurgist by degree. So right. uh, interesting choice. And uh, yeah, all, all, all signs are good on the inside. Everything's aligned. They want to build that U.S. supply chain. The okay. U.S. is subsidizing mining like never before. Um, the government is saying the right things. Um, Let's go back. I'll, I'll just touch quickly yes, on the technical ahead. team too. Please. Because we did bring uh, Danny Grobler over from, from Ivanhoe. I've never heard of Ivanhoe. <laughs> great name. Great uh, brand. Yes. Yeah, it sounds fantastic. And so okay. really what we've done is unite uh, two guys with 50 years of experience in the yeah. Bushfeld and bring them to Stillwater to two we guys we haven't mentioned, Justin and Butch, with 50 years of experience yeah. in, the bush, in the Stillwater complex. Similar rocks, new model, new thinking. Yep. Build it up. Yeah, <laughs> that sounds fantastic. Um, it really does. And that's really what you want to bet on the jockey, if you would. And it sounds like you got the right jockeys, if you would, into place. I want to go back to uh, how you are with the local, the local community there. That's very important. But before we go there, I want to talk about more of the share structure. You touched a little bit about it on it. But if you can, give me a percentage of what insiders own. Because as an investor, as an accredited investor myself, I'm very concerned about being diluted. And dilution, I can take it if it's for a good reason. Yes. Right? But if it's for funding somebody's yacht or if it's for drilling holes that a project that will never be produced. Yeah. I lifestyle company. Lifestyle companies, yeah. I'll get very, very disappointed. I'm very, very disappointed. So I want you to talk about that and then I want you to talk more about the grant because me as a potential investor, if you have access to money that's not gonna come from share dilution, that's very attractive to me in a company. So tell me about that. Sure. Shareholdings, um, the board and people close to us, management, are about 20%. 20%. Myself included. Okay. Greg Johnson's about 6 million shares. I'm about 6 million. Um, Glencore, of course, is 15.4%. Okay. They've written two checks inside of a year for that amount. 15% on top of the 20%. So we're looking at 35% total? That's 35 right there. Okay. Yeah. Uh, institutions make up another amount. I've forgotten exactly how much sitting here. Uh, U.S. Global's in there, OTP Bank out of Budapest, uh, Sprott Asset out of Toronto. Sprott? Sprott Asset, not okay. himself, yeah. Do you have, have any idea what the percentage is, not to put you on the spot, of what Sprott owns? Not at this okay. time. No. But I, it's important to me that they're an investor. Okay. We're 227 million uh, Shares. outstanding. 282 fully diluted. I've actually forgotten the warrant split and options. 282 split. fully diluted, that's what I want to know. Yeah. Excellent. And the options and warrants approximately divide that, yeah. that difference. Okay. Yeah. Key point on dilution is, and I take your point, that these pre-revenue companies, you've got to sell something to de-risk something and, yes. and fund the effort. Obviously, you can roll that down in a bad year and crank it up in a good year. We've kept 100% of this project with what comes next in mind, right? Mm -hmm. um, equity makes a lot of sense, and finding a major partner like Glencore yep. who would work without a project deal, without giving them 51% of the asset, and then at their option for the 29%, say, mm -hmm. for usually for work in the ground, we kept 100% of the asset. Um, say that again. We kept 100% of the project, and no royalty sales, nothing. There's a basic 2% NSR to what the vendor. What did they get out of this? I don't mean to interrupt you, but what did they get out of this if they well, got no royalties? Well, but not yet. We'll see. Yeah, I mean, we'll see. We, we could play that card we as we know what it's worth. I yes. got it. Okay. So the, the, what they get is a front row seat on something and a board seat. And they would be an excellent partner. They'd be an excellent partner. partner. But we want to date before we get married. We want to build this out properly. Yeah. They like my team. They yes. need Danny. They need the local guys. You know, we want to do this together. Uh, that's a key point. We've not sold a stream. We've not sold a royalty. We've not mm -hmm. um, diluted the asset. Yeah. And as the value becomes apparent, as the market gets that's better, huge. 
we can start to play those cards. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So because we're going to have to raise tens of millions at some point yes. to drive much bigger things. Which leads me to the grant. Talk to me about government funding and the grant. How does that work? And what is the likelihood that you would receive? Tell me what you can on record, if you would. <laughs> Well, look at the precedents. The DOD will fund drilling and feasibility studies. There are examples out there about yeah. that. You could go up to about 50 million before you need congressional approval. Where? Later. So you want to stay so, under 50 million? So you could bet that we've <laughs> gone for. Um, ideally, this is in response to an RFI and, and no lobby effort is required. And thankfully for us, they're approaching us and the lobby effort is done. They're basically saying, we need critical minerals. Fantastic. When can you be in production yeah. planning? Um, so you can bet that we're, we're in that effort. I don't know when I can say anything about it. I understand. It might be three months. It might be nine months. You know, we have an election in between two, which yeah. doesn't help, but you choose your horse accordingly. And you yeah. know. Uh, We're already uh, subject to partner on some DOE grants, Department of Energy grants. Those don't really fund the core work of finding a huge critical minerals deposit. Right. But they do show we're in front of the right people, we're credible, we're already in there. Yeah. And those are for carbon sequestration, hydrometallurgical work, as opposed to pyro smelting, but hydro, mm -hmm. and um, hydrogen generation work. So you can say on the record that that process is going. Yeah. I'm yeah. just back from touring a federal politician around the project uh, October 11th. It's a marvelous tour. All thumbs up. Excellent. Okay. So last question I would have, uh, how does the local community, are they involved in this and are they supportive of this, which I think is critical to any project, if you would. This is mining country. It's yeah. also kind of remote, too. There, there is nobody living on the project okay. or even beside it. Um, the local communities are supported by mining. Sabanye uh, was at one point, 10% uh, of the GDP of Montana mm -hmm. was Sabanye. Right. They just recently laid off 800 people due to palladium price. Um, their costs were something like 1800 1900 per ounce, so you can bet they were losing money. That brought bipartisan support from Senator John Tester, who I met, and Senator Daines, one Democrat, one Republican. Um, they both put motions forward uh, to support American mining, to support critical minerals, to support mining jobs in Montana, and to oppose Russian dumping of palladium as well, frankly. Um, so I've now got eight letters of support for the project and nothing negative is the, is the short answer. Okay, excellent. Now you just brought up, and that was gonna be my last question, so my question now is, um, this is in the mount, this is very remote. Talk to me about infrastructure. Does new infrastructure need to be built on this, or is it already built around there? Roads, power. When I say remote, it's not very remote. It's not Alaska, right? Where I'm from. Uh, <laughs> I love Alaska. Yeah, me too. Um, I mean, we're, a, we're an hour's drive from Billings. Okay. Um, so, yeah, we're near the town of Nye, Montana. If you come down to the Core Shack, the Core Shack's near Nye. You can see it in the pictures on my website. Okay. We often stay in Red Lodge. Um, there are mines operating right beside us. Um, in fact, Just plug into them. When you're in Nye, you will see the Stillwater Mill, which is also in pictures on my on my deck, about 10 minutes down the road from us. So that's not a problem. And our project is on the other side of that mill. So yeah, it's it's not a problem. Sabanye could punch through, say, two kilometers underground, to, okay. to mine our biggest and best deposit at Chrome Mountain on the west side of our work. If you think about it. Our stuff is kind of sitting up there, and their ad it goes out to the north. It's a really good block cave setup. Inexpensive mining. The adit is largely there. There's even a sulfide flotation mill on the other end of that adit, the East Boulder mine. Uh, now, Sabania is not a shareholder of ours. That's very forward looking, but there is uh, really good mining right next door to us that is, could be directly relevant. Okay, well, looking over my notes, let me just make sure I didn't miss anything. It's a fascinating story, and what's really important to me is that it's uh, critical mining, if you would, and in the geopolitical environment, even in the political environment, that seems to make things more even more critical. Um, anything 
missing that you would want to tell the audience or potential shareholders, if you would? Because we've been at this for a while, go ahead, look at that camera. Because we've been at this for a while, we have other assets. We have five assets in total. So Stillwater, by far the focus and by far the flagship. But you will see um, deals done on those other assets. They're now things that we can, we can play, if you will. There's a lot of flexibility. Yeah. 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 No. Excellent. Michael, uh, give me your ticker numbers, both in uh, over-the-counter as well as in uh, Toronto, and give me your website. You bet. The website is criticalminerals.com. Ticker is PGEZF here in the U.S. on the OTCQB, and in Canada as PGE uh, on the TSX Venture. Excellent, Michael. Appreciate your time. Thank you so much. Glad Take to care. be here. Cheers. Thanks.